And we're finishing up our uh, teaching through Acts chapter 13, Paul's first missionary endeavor and his first sermon. How many sermons did Paul preach? Eleven. This is the first of eleven. But we want to see the reaction that's taking place. And then we're going to springboard off of that and something we shared last week. And I gave you a little homework assignment. What was your homework assignment? That's right. What you said. Read Romans 9, 10, and 11. But right now, turn to Acts chapter 13. And thank you, John Michael, because what we need is more love. Not less fear, but more love. Love will compel you to share. Hmm? To know him more and to make him known. That's our purpose. And the more you know him, the more you love him. The more you love him, the more you'll serve him. And the way in which we serve him is by sharing his truth, the good news to everyone that we can. Amen? Yeah. Anybody feel timid about that? Raise your hand. You feel timid? Inequipped? Ill-equipped? Yeah, only a few honest people here. I have some trepidation every time I go to share. But I ask, Lord, Lord, give me a love for this person, for there's not a person I will ever meet that, you're cro- that you didn't die for, that your cross isn't there to lead them into salvation, Lord. And so I pray right now, Father, that you take away the timidity that so many feel, that you give us a loving boldness, Lord. You gave the Apostle Paul a love for the lost, and particularly lost Israel, that is beyond my comprehension, Lord. I could never, ever, ever imagine saying and stating what he did. But Lord, you put such a passion, a love, a concern, a grief, a sorrow in his heart for the lost. Would you do that for us, Jesus? Help us to see their situation, their lostness, Lord. As you do, use us, Lord, to be about the discovery of knowing who your Holy Spirit is working on and then investing, Lord, because you're the one who saves. We don't save anyone, Lord. Never have, never will. But, Lord, you save. But you use us as those instruments of your grace, those ambassadors of reconciliation, as we've shared. And so we pray more and more as time is drawing to a close, Lord, that you'll use us. Use us to share the good news with the lost and the dying and help us to be aware of those whom you are working on, Lord, whose minds have been opened, whose ears have been unstopped, Lord, whose hearts have been swelled, Lord, longing for you and to know the purpose and meaning of life. We ask all this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. And this morning after our service, we're going to go in the back, and I want to invite you all to come in the back with us because we're going to have a baptism. Now three that are here this morning have decided that they want to follow Jesus completely in baptism, identifying with his death upon the cross and his resurrection to new life. So we want to celebrate for a few minutes. I'm going to keep my my comments uh, brief this morning. Sure, I will. (laughs) But chapter 13 is where we ended up last time, and we saw that Paul was speaking to the Jews, and first he gave the history of Israel, and then he was giving the history of the Messiah. And as he gave the history of the Messiah to Israel, you would certainly believe that the Jews would be able to connect all of the dots, make sense of it all, and come to a reasonable conclusion. But nevertheless, that's not what happened. So in verse 42, it says, when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. The Gentiles wanted to know more about the Israelogy of the Bible, about the salvation that would come through the Messiah of Israel. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews devout and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Now I'm in verse 44. 44, chapter 13, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed those things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, to the Jews. But since you reject it, and you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord had commanded us. I have set you as a light unto the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. This is the Savior of the Lord. This is Jesus, the servant of God, spoken of in Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 49, and other prophetic utterances would declare that the gospel would go out to the Gentiles. And from the very beginning, it was always God's intention to save not just the Jew 
but the rest of the world as well, for those who are being called. Verse 48, he says, Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, glorified the word of the Lord, as many as had been appointed to eternal life. Appointed to eternal life? Anybody know what that Greek term is here for appointed? Tasso. And what does tasso mean? To ordain. To ordain? Yes, go ahead. To put in order. To put in order. It's a military term. Yes, you are placed in a station or a responsibility or a role, and God has appointed them. God has chosen them. God has ordained them. God did this. It wasn't the Gentiles pursuing God. It was God pursuing the Gentiles at this point. And he was closing the door on the gospel to the Jews, but he predetermined that, didn't he? And where would we find out that God had predetermined the rejection of the Messiah by Israel? In Romans. Thank you. That's where we're going to go in a little bit. But let's finish the text so we can, I, I can say I finished the chapter today, okay? Ordained to eternal life. Those appointed, those arranged, those ordained, assigned to. Isn't that amazing? And the word of the Lord, verse 49, was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city and raised a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, we see that what had happened, what had taken place here, the ministry of the Holy Spirit was no longer on Israel. It began in Jerusalem. It began with the Jews. And the first believers there after Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, were predominantly Jews. They weren't Gentiles. The, Jew, the Gentile Pentecost was when? Yes, Acts chapter 10, Cornelius. When Cornelius was saved and all of his household, then the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaGodesh, the Numa HaGiosune, spread out that witness to the Gentiles. What is the unpardonable sin? The only unpardonable sin is rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? And it's the Holy Spirit who bears witness of the person of Christ in the heart, in the mind of a believer. And that's what was taking place now, because God had predetermined the rejection of Messiah by Israel so that salvation could come to the Gentiles, who didn't know anything about the Messiah of Israel or anything about the history of Israel. Isn't that amazing to you? It's amazing to me how even today there's a veil or a blindness upon the Jewish people that they can't see who Jesus really is. Oh, would you pray with me for Carson Chase, a young Jewish boy that I met. He's 20 years old. I met him this week and I began to share with him and his eyes just, he had no understanding whatsoever of this glorious heritage, history, and what a privilege it was for him to be born a Jew. And I said, my savior was Jewish. Yeah. One woman said as we were passing by, oh, but some of my best friends are Jewish. I said, my best friend is Jewish. <laughs> but we talked last week as we ended the session in the fact that when Paul said, it was in verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, Jews. But since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, I said, that's where so many will use this as a proof text for their belief in supersessionism. Supersessionism is where they believe that the, the church, what is that word church in the Greek? Ecclesia. And what does it really mean? Called out assembly. And who's called out? Jews and both. Right. And both become the Israel of God. Okay. So make no mistake about that. There's so much a misunderstanding when we hear the word church. The word church is simply those whom God has called to be his own, those whom God has called to be his adopted sons and daughters, to come into that, that union. One new man now, not Jew, not Gentile, but one new man, believers in Messiah, surrendering our life to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen? Now, they would use this to say that, no, the church has superseded Israel, supersessionism. And it's pretty historic. And it's demonic. And it's her heretical. We also call that replacement theology, where the belief is, is that the church somehow has replaced Israel and the Jew. Preposterous. Far be it. And we looked at some of the promises that God had made 
back in the Old Testament with regard to the fact that he chose Israel to be his own in spite of their unfaithfulness repeatedly over and over and over again. If you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're no longer under the law, are you? For the law brings forth, but the Spirit brings forth life. How many of you have children that you love dearly? How many? Praise the Lord. I have one son. I adore that boy. He's not a boy anymore. He's 54. But see me later, and I can all after, spend all afternoon sharing my love for him and what a fine man he is. But it always hasn't been that way. Mm -mm. I can remember his 11th year of high school. He woke up one morning and lost his mind. Nearly lost his life. You know? <laughs> but I can tell you this. He's never, ever, ever not been my son. I have never, ever, ever not loved him because we're in a love relationship and love demands that we go the extra mile and extend ourselves, that we don't allow a separation. But no, we maintain the unity that we have of the spirit, the unity and the bond that we have in the faith, you see. Mm. So if you're in Christ, you're no longer in a legal relationship because previously you were in a legal relationship. You had to obey the law. And who could obey the law? It's an impossibility. For the law brings forth, the Spirit brings forth life. So now you're in a love relationship where you are God's child. You are his son. You are his daughter. Now and forever. You will never not be his son or daughter. You will never not be outside of his love for you. Oh, you may act in such a way that he has to chasten you. But God chastens those whom he loves. Yeah. Now, I said, I gave you some arguments as to why it's not true that God has not put Israel aside permanently, temporarily, for the sake of the salvation of the Gentile world. We looked at a couple of proofs. Go to Acts chapter 1 for a minute. We looked there at the very beginning of this history of the church. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says, And being assembled, now these were all Jews, all the disciples there, all Jews, believing in Messiah Jesus. And that's what happened on Pentecost. Pentecost chapter 2 of Acts was when Messianic Judaism was birthed, okay? The belief in Jesus as the Messiah, that's what was birthed then. That was the difference between those Jews who believed and the Jews who didn't believe. They absolutely believed and were certain of the fact that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the promises God made with regard to Messiah. Okay, but in verse four, it says, and being assembled together, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father. This would be the Holy Spirit, which he said, you have heard from me and John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And what was the response to that? Verse six. Well, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? No, the church is superseding Israel. No, the church has replaced Israel. No, there's no kingdom for you guys. You are really messed up. Is that true? Is that what he said? No, well, look what he said. Look at the response of the Messiah. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth, in Greenville, in Simpsonville, in Grr. <laughs> You're called to be those witnesses today. The book of Acts never ended, you know. We get to chapter 28, it's an open ending. It's not ended. Why? Because Luke is still recording the acts of the disciples of Jesus Christ today. Those acts that you would perform, that I would perform. On behalf of the glory of God and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Look at chapter 3, though. There is a kingdom promised to Israel that is yet to come. God, God has promised that Israel will possess all of the landmass that he promised them, all the way from the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Sea, to the river Euphrates, and they will occupy that during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. God has promised the believers of the church, those who are spiritually indwelt by the Holy Spirit, heaven. God has promised Israel, literal physical Israel, a place on earth. Do you understand that? Look with me for a moment. When did I say? Chapter 3? Go to chapter 3 of Acts. Uh, he's, Peter is, this is Peter's sermon, three of seven that he performs. 
that he shares. And he's saying, uh, talking about how Israel had rejected Jesus, how they killed the Messiah, the Prince of Life, but they did it in ignorance. Verse 17, yet now, brethren, I know that you did this ignorantly, ignorant, in ignorance, as did your rulers. Verse 18, now chapter 3, but those things which God had foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Everything that went just according to his God said, aren't we glad for the prophetic word of God? Aren't we glad for Bible prophecy? Well over 90% of Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. There's a very short amount of prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Are you certain it's going to take place? I am. I am. And so I believe the word of God in spite of what may be happening geopolitically. You know, some people are saying now that, that Israel is done for. Israel is finished. When this war finally breaks out between Israel and the rest of the Muslim world and those who are joining in them and supporting it for all the nations of the world will stand against the word says that all the nations of the world one day will stand against Jerusalem. But they're saying that Israel will be destroyed. It will be no more. It's going to be annihilated completely. The one Jewish state in all of the world. They don't want it to exist. How many Muslim states are there? How many Muslim countries are there? 26 or something of that nature. And now they want to give the Palestinians a state of their own so that there's 27. They're not satisfied with 27 states, Muslim states. They don't, how many Israeli, how many Jewish states do they want to exist? None. None. But will that take place? Why? Because God is going to protect. God has guaranteed the only nation on the face of the earth that has a favored nation status in the eyes of the Almighty is Israel. You understand that? No one is going to destroy Israel. No one is going to destroy the Jewish people. Why? Because of God's promises that he made to them, and they will be a blessing to the entire world. Yeah. But look at the text, chapter 3. Finish it up. Now, Peter is hearkening to them, and he's calling them to repentance. Why has this judgment come upon Israel? Because of the rejection of God in trying to perform a work of righteousness upon their own works, rather than by faith in believing the promises of God. And that's an impossibility. What should we be crying out today? You know, uh, I don't agree with the Pope very often, but the Pope said now we have to vote between two evils, right? Is that true, two evils? Yes, it's true. Which candidate is pro-life? Which candidate still maintains the sanctity of marriage? Neither. Both of them are pro-alphabet people. You know the alphabet people, LGBTQ, XYZ. Hmm? Both of them are pro-abortion, right? Both those things God says are an abomination. So what are you really voting for? You're voting for strong borders. You're voting for prosperity. You're voting for things of this world that you can enjoy. And we're not voting for righteousness. We're not voting for holiness. I don't hear anybody crying out for the nation to repent. We want a strong prosperity and a, st a strong economy. We want a safe border. We want America to be great again. I want America to be holy. I want America to be righteous. We are one of the most unrighteous, ungodly societies on the face of the earth today. Demand the right to slaughter our babies. Speaking of babies. Congratulations, Jonathan. Yeah, and that little, new little granddaughter, Amelia Grace. You want to see a picture? Show a picture. Yeah. Amelia Grace, born? Born by faith. For by grace you have been saved through? And that not of your own uh, gift of God, not of, not of you, not of works, at least any man should... Her mother's name is Faith. Huh? Grace, born of faith. <laughs> oh, show my funny there. It's not funny. My body didn't have a choice. That's true. But aren't we, aren't we glad that every child, even little Leo at Bell's Crossing the other day, tragedy, as tragic as it was, every child who leaves here before the age of accountability, where are they? In the arms of Jesus, in heaven, enjoying a life that you and I can't even comprehend. Praise God. 
And, and this Tuesday at the Good News Club, you know, we, we sponsor, we, Community Chapel, sponsor the Good News Club at Bell's Crossing Elementary School, where this tragedy took place. And, and Miss Deborah has got the task of trying to share with the children this Tuesday how to process this. Yeah. Somebody lay hands on Deborah right now. It's good. It is good. Lord, we pray for a supernatural anointing upon our sister as she shares with these children, Lord. These children who, can't, they have a very, very difficult time processing any of this, Lord. And they're going to come to school and they're going to be afraid, thinking that maybe they're going to drown or they're going to die or something's going to happen to that boogeyman is there, the monsters are there. Lord, I pray right now, you, you use our sister and the rest of the helpers that come and support that ministry every week, Lord. Use them to comfort these children in your love, Lord. To be absolutely secure in your love for them, Lord. I pray you bless her, Lord, that you would speak through her, Lord, that your thoughts, her thoughts will be your thoughts, her words will be your words. We pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Bless her. And amen. Amen. Yeah, God's going to use you, Deborah. So Peter goes on there in chapter 3, and he says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. That's the only way your sins can be blotted out. You have to come to repentance and recognize that Jesus Christ did something for you you could never do for yourself, that Jesus Christ died for you, that he lived a perfectly sin-free life. How is that possible? We, the creed that we recite every single week are, is a concise doctrinal statement on what you must believe to be saved. And if there's any part of that creed that you don't accept or believe, I question your salvation. That was developed way back in the 300s because most people didn't have the scriptures. They didn't have a scroll. And so the church wanted to share with them, the believers wanted to share with them what the essentials were on which you must believe in order to be saved. And that Jesus came born of a truly man, truly God. Mary was his mother, but who was his father? So what was he born without? Natural sin. That's sin nature, natural sin. And therefore, he could be the sin bearer. Therefore, he could live a perfectly sin-free life and then die on my behalf and yours and take on himself the penalty, penalty I was deserving. Amen? Yeah, so repent. Repent, he says in verse 19 of chapter 3, therefore, and be converted. Be changed, right? <laughs> Become untwisted. This is the word. Isn't that amazing? That's what the word means, become untwisted. <laughs> oh, boy. How many needed fixing before Jesus got into your life? Oh, man, did I need fixing. <laughs> it straightened me out. Be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come in the presence of the Lord. And then he men send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Wow. So what is he saying there? Now, to come against replacement theology or supersessionism, what he's saying there, when Israel, when Israel says, Baruch Atah B'Shem B'shem Adonai. What? What's that mean? Baruch Atah B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus said, you'll not see my face again until you say, blessed is he who comes. Well, who is he speaking to? Israel, to the Jews. Yeah. He, when he, before, that last Seder, I know the Gentiles call it the Last Supper. It wasn't the Last Supper. It was the Last Seder, the last Passover meal that he celebrated with his disciples. He didn't drink the fourth cup, the fourth cup, the taking out. He didn't drink that cup. He said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. Hmm? But here, Peter is making it very explicit that the Christ will come when Israel is accepting of him once again, and then he will return, and there'll be times of refreshing and restoration for the whole world. We sang, the whole world groans, does it? What is the desire? What's the, what's the world groaning for? To be restored back into paradise. Paradise lost, paradise restored. We can't even imagine how wonderful this world is going to be when Christ comes and it's restored to its original purpose. The original creation. If Israel then, if Israel, all of Israel then had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, repented, confessed their sins, and made him Messiah, what would have happened? 
he would have come back from earth. He would have come back to earth from heaven. And it would have been over. And they would have been out in, and who would have been out? Lessons, right? But that wasn't God's plan. Now, I said to you, the other, the other argument for the fact that God has not forsaken his people Israel, that he has not rejected Israel, that the church has not superseded Israel, the church has not replaced Israel, is found in Romans 9, 10, 11. We're going to go quick through that fairly quickly. Now, after we finish the book of Acts, Lord willing, we're going to go into Romans. And I will go into far more detail on those chapters when we get there. But for, for this morning's sake, I'm going to do it very quickly. So go to Romans 9, if you would. Nine, ten, and eleven. If you were going to sum up, relative to the history of Israel, or relative to history specifically, if you're reading nine, ten, and eleven, how would you sum up those three chapters? Okay, it, it, it describes it. Now, relative to Israel, it's God's sovereignty in choosing Israel. But chapter nine deals with Israel past. Thank you. Chapter ten deals with Israel present. Chapter eleven deals with Israel future. Past, present, future. Okay? So what he's talking about in the past, it says how God has purpose to choose Israel. He chose the Jewish people. He chose the sons of Abraham, the sons of Isaac, the sons of Jacob. He chose them to represent his love, his moral, ethical, his moral and ethical purity to the world and the salvation that he would bring through the Messiah of Israel. That's what, did he chose them because he loves them any more than he loves you? No. No, he just chose them for this service in representing him. But he loves all of us, doesn't he? But chapter 9, look at this. Paul is writing now. And you have a heading in your Bible? Okay, mine says Israel's rejection of the Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew Mashiach. Christos in the Greek is the translation of the Hebrew Mashiach. Mashiach means Messiah. Messiah. So please understand that Christ is Messiah. So I tell you the truth in Messiah. I do not lie. I'm not lying. That's good, Paul. We don't want you lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. And I, I, before God, I swear to God, he's saying, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For what? For the lostness of his people. Now, I, listen, I'll be honest with you. I don't understand this kind of passion. I don't understand this kind of love. I don't understand this kind of sorrow and grief for the lost. I should have it. I pray for it. But look what he goes on to say. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ, for my brethren, for my countrymen, according to the flesh. Who are Israelites? Wow. Have you ever, have you ever said to God, Lord, curse me and save have you ever said that? Now, listen, I just told you how much I love my son, but I've never said that. I've never said, no, you know, you know if, you, if, you got, if you got to curse me to save my son, Lord, do it. If you got to send me to hell forever. I just, I, this kind of love, this kind of passion, this kind of understanding of the lostness, of the lost, is, I, it escapes me. I'm sorry. But I pray for it. You know, if you're, if you're going to take the way of the master, if you're, if you're going to really purpose to share Jesus, it's not because you want to win an intellectual argument or prove your, your theological abilities, but it's because you really love people and you want to see them saved. Do you have a love for the lost? Sitting in my car, Going to Walmart, watching some people walk, walk into a particular Walmart I went in, and then going in myself and thinking, wow, these people are different. You know, it's, I, listen, I just, I'm just saying it, you know. Change, our society's changed, our culture's changed. You know, you're not a typical American. It's crazy what's out there today. But then the Lord said, I died for every one of them. God forgive me. God, forgive me. Lord, give us a love for the lost, Lord. Please, Lord Jesus, put in our hearts the love that you have for them, Lord. 
I can't understand and I don't understand. I know that I ever will understand Paul's love for his brethren, that he would, he would be accursed. He would give up his place in heaven for them. Lord, move in our hearts. As John Michael was sharing this morning, let us be two percenters. Let us share our love for you with the lost continually, Lord, and give us a love for them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, according to the flesh, who are Israelites? To whom pertain the adoption? What does that mean, the adoption? Well, they were called the Son of God. When, when God was calling Moses to be the deliverer, to take them out of Egypt, he told Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my adopted son. Right? And so that's what he's talking about there. Israel had chosen, or God had chosen the sons of Jacob, which he called later on Israel, right? To be his own. Aren't you glad that you've been adopted? We are the horiathesia that Paul would talk about in Galatians, the adopted adult children of God, that God chose to. If you're here this morning and you come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's only because God purposed to adopt you in the court of heaven. He declared your name, wrote a certificate of ad adoption. Isn't that wonderful? But Israel was adopted by God as a nation, as a whole. God elected them. God chose them. They pertain to the adoption and the glory. When, when, did, when did they see the glory of God? When was the glory of God manifest to Israel and no one else? When did that happen? The Shekinah for 40 years. For 40 years, he was a pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day. The Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. And the Shekinah glory of God, that Shekinah rested in the temple that Moses built at the, there at the mercy seat, at the ark, in the Holy of Holies. Not only the adoption, but the glory, the manifestation of God in his glory came to Israel. No one else. And the covenants. What covenants are we talking about? Well, it goes all the way back to Adam. The Adamic covenant, the Noah covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, the Davidic covenant. Oh, the new covenant. It belonged to them and they didn't understand that alone. And the covenants and the giving of the law. Who was the law given to? It was given to the Jews. Now, there's three principal ways in which God has revealed himself to the world. The first way is through creation. Creation just demands you understand that there's a designer creator. This world is so complex and so intricate. Just the human body alone, fearfully and wonderfully made. It demands that there is a designer and a creator. To believe in evolution is preposterous. It's like believing, you see this watch? I found this on Paris Mountain. Anybody had Paris Mountain lately? I found this up on Paris Mountain in the right climatic condition over thousands of years. And, and the atmosphere changed such that this march formed. And I found it there. Magical creation of the universe, of nature. Is that true? No. Nonsense. It demands that there's a designer creator, right? Right? Well, how much more your eyeball? Do you understand the accuracy of the eyeball alone? It, make, it makes the engineering of this watch look like child's play in comparison. Yes, the first way in which God has displayed himself or manifested himself to the world is through creation. Through creation, you see his genius, his power. What else do you see? His love. His order, but his love. God created this world and all things therein for whose pleasure? For yours. Think about the things you've done for your children just for their pleasure. The things you created or the, the work you've done or something you've made or something, all for their pleasure. Just to, just to enjoy them enjoying what you created for them. All this world created for our pleasure. There's only one thing in this world he created for his pleasure. What was it? You. This whole world and everything they're in created for your pleasure by God, but he created you for his pleasure. To have communion with him. Hmm? The second way in which he revealed himself to the world is what we're just talking about, the law. What did he reveal through the law? I'm sorry? The need for a savior. Well, well the, it tells us our need for a savior, but what the law demonstrated was God's moral and ethical purity. He's pure. He's perfect. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Really? The woman at the well, go and sin no more. Really? You, you, you're playing a trick on me? 
Only through the person of the Holy Spirit is that possible. So, so what the moral and ethical purity of God showed us through the law is that we are sinners. I need a Savior. And then the most perfect expression of God came in the form of his son, Jesus. His son, Jesus. Philip, have you been so long a time with me that you don't recognize that I am in the Father and the Father in me? That we are one and the same? Yes, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, and the service of God. That's the priesthood. What a wonderful privilege it is to represent God to the people and the people to God. And that was only, that was Israel's function. The greatest king that Israel had was David, right? David, the man who had a whole heart for God. David, who loved God with all his heart, imperfect, just like every other man. The best of men are men at best. That's all we are, right? But if David could have been anything else rather than be king, rather than be of the tribe of Judah, what would he want to be? A priest. Because his, he had a heart of worship. His desire was fellowship with God. That's all he desired. And if he could have been anything else, he would have wanted to be a priest. But that was given to the sons of Aaron. You know the truth, right? Well, you had to have Levi jeans in order to be a priest. Is that what you're wearing this morning? <laughs> The giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. What promises are we talking about? All of the prophetic utterances that the Old Testament made with regard to the promises to Israel, that Israel would be sustained by God forever, and the promise of the Messiah who would come, who would save Israel from their sins, and save Israel from their enemies. Wow, what a privileged position Israel had. And that's what he's talking about here. And how did this come about? Because of Israel's faithfulness? Oh, we read they were very unfaithful in all of the Old Testament, weren't they? But God is faithful even when we are faithless. Why? He cannot deny himself. He says that through Paul to young Timothy, speaking to us, the Ecclesia, the call of assembly, but that's true of Israel as well. God will be faithful even when Israel is faithless. And the promises of whom are the fathers, from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. Now he goes into a doxology, who is over all, the eternal blessed God, amen? You know, just mention the name word Christ, and here he goes off into praise, you know? The eternal blessed God, he's control of everything. He's large and in charge, aren't you glad? <laughs> so what he's talking about here is that the Christ, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world would come through the Jewish people, through the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. Etc. But he goes on to say, verse 6, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. All of this, all of this God had done, all of this God had revealed to them through his words, through his prophets, through the person of the Christ. But, but does that mean that the word is null and void? It took no effect whatsoever on Israel? No. For they are not all Israel who are Israel, nor are the, all the children because they are of the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called that is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the children of seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Well, of course he must have chosen Isaac. Why would he chose Isaac and not choose Ishmael? That makes all the sense in the world, the Jews would say. Why? Because Ishmael was the son of a slave girl. A Gentile. But Isaac, Isaac was the son of promise. Yes, they had the same father, but different mothers. So Paul defeats that argument. Look what he says next. Verse 10, but not only this, not just Isaac and Ishmael, and God chose Isaac, and it wasn't because Ishmael's mother was somebody else, Hagar. And not only this, but then when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even our father Isaac... For the children not met being born, nor having done anything good or evil at the purpose of God, according to... Ooh. You know, some people just, just despise that word. I am so thankful. I'm one of the elect. That God pardoned me. God rescued me. Yes, according to election. That the purpose might stand, not of works, but of him who calls... And it was said to her, the older, who was the older? Esau shall serve the younger. Who was the younger? As it is written, Jacob I have 
love, but Esau I have. Whew, boy, that's a hard one to understand, isn't it? Hmm. Jesus says in Luke, if in order to be my disciple, what's your relationship to your family members? You need to hate them. Now, does he really want you to hate your mother and father? Does he really want you to hate your son or daughter? Does he really want you to hate your spouse? No, no. It's, it's comparative, okay? He accepted and chose Jacob. He rejected Esau. Now, we're not just talking about individual personalities. We're talking about nations, national status. We're talking about Israel being replaced by the church. Never. Perish the thought. God forbid. It's preposterous. God chose Israel. He chose Israel through Abraham. He chose Israel through Isaac. He chose Israel through Jacob and through the 12 tribes. Not that he hated Jacob in the way we would use the word hate. Jesus said, in order to be my disciple, you need to have what attitude towards this world and your own life? You need to hate it. Now, now is he talking about really hating your life, hating the world? No, 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 no. But he's talking about comparative preference. What is your preference? What is your choice? Do you, do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? People ask all the time, you know, what, what's, what's, what, how do I know that I'm ready for the rapture? How do I know that I'm, I'm worthy? Because Jesus said, pray always that you will be found worthy to escape these things that should come upon the whole world. How do I know that I'm worthy to escape these things? Is Jesus first. Now, you're the only person that can answer that. Not your mother, not your father, not your son, not your daughter, not your husband, not your wife. It's Jesus first. And before anything else in this world that this world will have to offer you, is it really Jesus you're longing for? Yes, in order to be my disciple, you need to hate this world and hate your own life in this world. Now that's what he's referring to. It's comparative. But go to Genesis 25 for a minute. We'll go to Malachi first. You know the Italian prophet, Malachi? Last book of the Old Testament. He's not talking about individual personalities. He's not talking about the individual Isaac, the individual Esau, Jacob and Esau, I mean. He's talking about nations and the favorite nation status that he would have for Israel. And it would be forever. There's no shelf life to it. There's no expiration date in his love for Israel. I'm, where am I? Malachi, chapter 1. Malachi 1. Last book of the Old Testament. Go to Matthew and go one more book to the left and you're there. Go to the first chapter, please. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel. This involves Israel, the nation, by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved. Now who was Israel? Israel was the sons of Jacob. So he's speaking of his love and his preference, his choice of Israel. I have loved Jacob. But Esau I have hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jekylls of the wilderness. Even through Edom, he said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Now he's talking about the difference between the nation of Edom, which were the descendants of Esau, and the nation of Israel, the descendants of Jacob. Do you understand? So when he uses this text in chapter 9 of Romans, and he says, Jacob, I love Esau, I've hated, he's talking about his preference for the nation of Israel. He has not rejected Israel, nor he ever will. Go to Genesis 25. You with me on this? Am I, not, am I losing anybody? It's important you understand this because this demonic doctrine of replacement theology is spreading unbelievably through Christendom today. And it's demonic. It is the very thing that is allowing for passive and aggressive anti-Semitism to exist. It's the reason why all the nations of the world one day will turn against Jerusalem. It's the reason why so much of the church, Christendom, is turning from Israel today. How, how is it that we have this generation of Christian young people growing up in the church proclaiming they're Hamas, anti-Israel, pro-Hamas, we're Hamas. 
Billy Graham's granddaughter started, 2020, started the, the organization. Evangelicals for Biden, and now it's Evangelicals for Harris, Evangelicals for Hamas, Evangelicals for, for abortion, for the alphabet people, for anti-Israel. It's unbelievable, isn't it? How the devil has brainwashed people, has so twisted their thinking. To be converted, what has to happen? All that, this has to be an untwisting of your thinking. Where did I say to go? That's right, Genesis 25. Uh, Rebecca, his wife, conceived, verse 21, the end of 21. Rebecca, she conceived. But the children struggling together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I this way? You say that, I say that every morning I wake up. Jesus, if all is well with me, why am I still this way? You know. I'm not talking about the way you are. I'm talking the way I am. But don't you have a problem with the way you are? Okay, it's going to be okay. You're going to get fixed. Okay, we're in the process of being fixed. It's called sanctification, right? But she said, if all is well, why am I this way? And he said, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I this way? And, and she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two nations now. Who are the two nations? Israel and Edom, right? Israel and the Gentiles, right? Or Edom, excuse me. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Now, that's what he's talking about here. So please understand that when we see that text in display of God's sovereignty and choice, God chose Abraham, God chose Isaac, God chose Jacob, God chose Israel. God chose Israel to reject Messiah. God chose you. Wow. Wow. And through God choosing you, who's he going to choose next? Israel. Go back to Romans chapter 9. I just want to explain that, that 13th verse because it's difficult for a lot of people. So the children are twins, same father, same mother, having done nothing, no sin, no good, no evil, but so that the election or predestination of God would stand, he chose Jacob, the nation of Israel. What should we say then? Verse 14, is there unrighteousness with God? That is not, what do people say? It's just not, you want fair? You want fair? Where's fair going to bring everybody? To hell. If you want fair. No, God is not fair. He is just. He is just. Do you understand the justice of God? Now, I do not have the mind of God. I cannot stand in judgment of God nor his ways. Can you? Who do you think you are, oh man? Where were you when I created the stars of the universe? That was Job's problem. Standing in judgment of God. What arrogance. But pride, how audacious. And that's what Paul is saying here. You can't stand in judgment of God. God is just. And just know that everything that he does is in fact just. And he has the right to choose to save some. Is God all powerful? Omnipotent? I'm knowing? Omnipresent? Is that true? Then the question we have to ask ourselves is why does he save anybody? And why doesn't he save everybody? I don't have the mind to tell you the answer to that question. God is just. That's all I do know. I don't want him to be fair. No, we don't want him to be fair. If he was fair, he'd send every one of us where we belong. But he chooses to pardon and save some. Israel was undeserved, totally undeserving of God's favor. But he gave it unconditionally, sacrificially, just as Jesus did to you and I. Totally unmerited.
What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whomever I have compassion. And so then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs. What does that mean? It's not of him who wills. It's not your desire or your choice. No, you didn't desire it. You didn't choose it. It's God who works within you both to will and to do. He gives you the desire. He gives you the ability. It's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs. What does that mean, him who runs? Your own effort works. It's, it's, listen, it's not of works, nor is it of man's desire, but it's God alone who's choosing. Go with me to John, the apostle of love. John chapter 1 for a minute. I'm going to have to continue this next week. Is that okay? I'm running out of time. And I have so much more I want to share with you. Where did I say to go? John. What verse? I didn't say. I didn't say. Good. Some of you are paying attention. Okay, I said go to John chapter 1. He, Jesus, verse 10. 110, look at this. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Unbelievable. <laughs> the Savior of Israel, they did not know him. The Messiah, they did not know him. <clears throat> Only God can make it known to you who Jesus is. Only God can open up the mind and the heart and the understanding. Only God can open up the ears. You got to pray for your lost friends and family. God, give them the grace gift of faith to believe. Open their minds, open their ears, open their hearts to the truth, Lord, so they can see you for who you really are. Apart from that, we're still groping in the dark. Blind men. We're worse than that. Paul says you're a necros. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You're a corpse. Hmm. But look what John says here. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own. Who was that? The Jews. And his own did not receive him. For, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. The the adopted children of God. As I said this morning, you're adopted sons and daughters. To those who believe in his name. How did you come to believe? Now, this word belief, pastuo, means to completely surrender your life to, to entrust him. Do you really trust the Lord? I'd say about 2% of people do. 2% of professing Christians trust the Lord. Show me your day timer. Show me your check register. I'll tell you how much you trust the Lord. Oh, but I can't afford it. You can't. You can't afford not to. You can't afford not to trust the Lord with everything and anything. Every time you had to give up your children to the Lord, go in a direction that you couldn't persuade them to turn from. My son was going to these liberal schools. You know, he, I mean, he's, he graduated from Citadel. I was happy about that. But then he went over to Duke University and started to listen to some of the the liberal professors there, Elaine Pegels and such. And then he goes to Duke University. And, and so his mother and I would just get on her knees and pray because he's far more intelligent than I am. You know, you want your children to exceed your development spiritually, intellectually, physically. Well, he's done that. And, and, and there were times we'd sit and try to talk with him. And, you know, he, I mean, he's using language. I don't even say, dumb it down, son. Dumb it down for me. Okay, doctor. I know PhD piled high and deep. Dumb it down. And so I pray and pray and pray and say, Lord, please open his eyes. I can't persuade him. You have to. And I'll thank you, God. Thank you, God. But I had to give him to God. I said, look, there's nothing we can do. Roberta, we just got to pray. That was his mother's name. Roberta, we just have to pray and trust God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You answered those prayers. Thank you, Lord. Do you trust God? Do you really? Those who believe, pastor, put their trust in him. He gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name, Yeshua, Jesus, the Savior, who was born, who were born. That's you, who were born, it says, not of blood. What does that mean? Not your ethnicity. The Jews weren't saved because they were Jews. You're not Christian because you're in America or you're an American. You're not saved because your parents are saved. You're Christians. You're not saved because your spouse is a Christian. No, it's not by ethnicity. It's not by birth. You understand? It'll never be by birth. And that's what the Jews thought. Hey, we're Jews. We're in. We got nothing to worry about. 
We're the people of God. Do you know how many people think that today? you know how many people are gathering together in churches today believing they're Christians simply because of their works? Because they're born in America. Hmm? Not of blood, John writes. And then he says, nor of the will of the flesh. What is that? Not by desire, which is exactly what Paul was saying there in Romans. It's not by desire. It's not by will. Him who wills, nor him who runs. It's not by your desire. It's not by your works. It's not by your ethnicity. It's not by your blood. It's not where you were born. It's not by your own desire or will or inclination. You have no inclination toward God. You're an enemy with God until Christ opens your eyes. And then he says, what else does he say? Not of the will of man, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, what does that mean, the will of man? Religious system. Any man-made system will not save you. Talking to this Jewish young man, you're going to pray for him, right? What's his name? Carson. Carson Chase. Carson Chase. Oh, you see, I wish I had more time. He was working. It was on his lunch hour. I was sitting at a table, you know, and there was a nice lounge chair right next to that table. I chose not to sit in that chair. He comes over, and he's on his break, and he said, you know, I want to sit in that chair. So what do you want from me? Well, you're at this table. Well, I said, I'm waiting for somebody. Well, I mean, yeah, but I want to sit in that chair. It's my break time, and I like sitting in that chair. I said, you want me to move over there? I said, you work there, and you want me to move? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I moved. And then we started a conversation, right? No, I mean, that was just beautiful, you know. Just, and what a handsome young man. Reminded me of David. Ruddy looking, you know, handsome boy, you know but started to share with him this wonderful choice that God made of Israel to be continued. So he's going to call me. I know he will. You pray that he calls me. We're going to pray for him. But not of desire, not of a man-made system, okay? It's not of religion. And, I, and he said, well, you know, my, my, mom, my mom's Jewish, but, you know, she became, uh, an, uh, she, he didn't say evangelical. He said she goes to a non-denominational church. I don't know what's going on with her. Really? He says, I don't want anything to do with religion. I said, me either. I said, there are lots of religions in the world, and so many of them contradict one another. I said, I don't believe in religion. I believe in a relationship with God. I believe in spiritual relationship with my creator. Don't you? No man-made system. Every religious system in the world is man's attempt at receiving approval before God by their works, not of works, for by grace, caris, you have been saved, right? Through faith, pistos, right? Not of works, but a, what was the gift? Faith. Faith is a gift. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Faith is a gift. God gives the grace gift of faith to believe. Opens up the eyes, opens up the heart, unstops your ears, and salvation occurs. Not of blood, nor of desire, nor of works, but how does he end it? But of God. God. Next week. I'm sorry. Unless you want to stay here. We got all afternoon. I mean, I, got, you know, I could do this day and night. You know, but we got a baptism, some folks. Right? We got to baptize some folks. Can I talk to you about baptism for a minute? Now, there's lots of different beliefs with regard to the mode of baptism. How do, how do some people baptize? Sprinkle. Okay? How do some other people baptize? There was, a, you know, the little autistic boy, Leo. There was an autistic boy that my son was ministering to when he was at Fort Bragg. And it was in his house, and they're watching a group of people in the Bible study group. They're watching the film Jesus of Nazareth. And it got to where John was baptizing in the river, and some people started talking about baptizing. And little Robbie, you know, Robbie's autistic, and so he had to go to the bathroom. And he's a long time in the bathroom. My son went to look for him, and he's soaking wet. <laughs> he's in the bathroom with a glass, and he's just pouring the water over his head. <laughs> He said, Robbie, what are you doing? I'm baptizing myself. <laughs> now, now, there's some groups that do that. They'll pour water over your head, you know? But historically, what's the mode by which we baptize? Full immersion. Full immersion, right? Now, now let, let's say you're, you know, how many, how many servicemen do we have here? Anybody serve in Desert Storm? or No. But when you're in the service, sometimes you're not at a place where you can fully immerse someone in water. My son led many, a soldier, to faith. 
But he would take his canteen cup and he'd fill it with water and he'd pour the water over their head. Is that legitimate? Sure. Of course it is. It's not the mode. It's not sprinkling or pouring water or, sun or immersing in the water. It's the heart's disposition. That's important. Now, we want to follow the Lord's example. And the Bible example, which is full immersion. And why? Because you're identifying with the death and burial of Jesus Christ. When you bury somebody, you don't sprinkle water or dirt on them, do you? You don't pour dirt over their head. You put them in a hole, cover it up, right? <laughs> Buried in the ground. Now, when you come up out of the water, it's likening unto Jesus Christ's resurrection. You rise to the newness of life. And this ancient sacrament of baptism identifies us with the early church going all the way back to the first century. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Now, the mode, as I said, we like full immersion, okay? Uh, the meaning of baptism. Is it salvific? Does it save you? No, no. What is the meaning? It's symbolic. It's sim simply an outward sign of an inward change that's already occurred in your life where Jesus has become your Lord and Savior. You don't want to become self-directed anymore. You don't want to become self-governing. You want Jesus Christ to reign over your life now. I don't want to be in control of my life. I did that for a while. It didn't work out very well for me. And I don't know about you, but I want him to take control. Right? So the meaning is symbolic, but you're identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Raised to the newness of life. Romans chapter 6. Hmm? The necessity. What's the necessity for baptism then? What you said. Yeah, sure. <laughs> because Jesus commanded it. So if you want to live a completely obedient life to the Lord Jesus Christ, which we should if you're, if you're a Christian... And you love Jesus, then you want to live in obedience to his word. And part of his word commands that you be baptized. It doesn't save you, but he commands that you become a public witness of what he has done on your behalf. So the necessity, so that I can live a completely obedient life to Christ. The subjects of baptism. We do not believe in infant baptismal regeneration. Does the Bible teach that infants should be baptized? Unto salvation? No. But there are many groups that believe that today, don't they? No, no, no. What does the Bible teach relative to infants? Dedication. That we should dedicate our children unto the Lord. Right? Offer them to the Lord and, and ask the Lord to guide them and direct them and may never, may they never, ever, ever know a day in their life they haven't walked with you, Jesus. I pray that for all of our children. So, the mode, the meaning, the method the necessity. And now we're going to go to the back, and I want you to join me as three of our, two of our sisters, one of our brothers, are going to share on the baptism that they're going to have performed today, this sacrament, ancient sacrament, going all the way back to the first century church, and what it means to them, and we're going to celebrate with them. So don't leave. Don't use it as an excuse to get in your car and go. Shame on you. Let's go back and celebrate with our brothers and sisters. All right? All right. I'll meet you back there. Jonathan, you got a closing song?